Uh, yeah, so also hi from my side. Uh, glad that you made it. Um, hope, <coughs> I hope you still have like a lot of energy in you for the session today. I think the session is, I hope it's kind of good for now because it's like a little bit lighter on the on the mass and the, on the like, theory and a little bit um, easier, I hope, to digest, which is good because you're still digesting something else. Um, yeah, so uh, I can't skip that right now. So I kind of did my PhD partially in automated machine learning, partially in fairness. That's sort of my background. Um, and a year ago, I left academia and went into industry, and that's where I'm right now. But I'm still like tied to industry, and that's what I'm uh, tied to academia and tied to sort of the research, and I want to continue doing that slowly. Um, yeah, and that's what I'm doing right now, and that's why I'm presenting. Today. All right, so the first thing I wanted to start with is automata as tool building. Um, so the idea here is that basically, when we build automated systems, we build tools for others to use. And with the tools we, use, we build others, we empower others to do, to solve their tasks more efficiently, better, to solve tasks that they couldn't solve before. And with that, we basically give them, <coughs> yeah, basically a tool um, that, that sort of helps them in their, yeah, to achieve more, to achieve better. Um, and I sort of chose this quote to start uh, today, um, which basically says, yeah, technology is a powerful servant, but a dangerous master. And what I mean with that is that if we build tools, we also have to make sure that we use them or like people use them responsibly and that the tools are not only for like a select few, but that they actually benefit everybody. Um, all right, and then there's a small disclaimer. Um, so today I'm going to talk about fairness um, with the intersection of, uh, the intersection of also now. Um, but I also touch upon topics um, that are ethics and law, and I don't know anything about those topics. I've like, read one or two papers, but I don't know a lot, so consume with care. Um, and uh, yeah, if in doubt, read up on the stuff or ask something, somebody who knows stuff. Um, I'm sort of giving you what I understood from that. I might have sort of the machine learning perspective, which might be helpful for you, might, might make it easier to digest, but it's, yeah, uh, so no guarantees on that. Fair enough. Um, so because we are at the autumn of four schools, um, I'll naturally touch up on autumn now, um, which is sort of the second part for today. Um, the first part, um, to sort of get you up to speed on fairness a little bit and why the things we are discussing to make have them make sense. Basically, I wanted to give a short introduction um, to fairness. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions, I would be super happy if you just like ask it right away. Uh, don't wait, because uh, if you don't ask any questions, you just listen to me speaking for an hour, and I think nobody wants that. So yeah, just just go ahead. Uh, also, if it's not a question, but just like a critical remark or anything, uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, would be nice if. Um, so I have not like really planned a discussion, but like if a discussion pops up, if you find something interesting, I'm super happy to sort of like be fair to that as well. All right. Uh, really happy? Yeah. Looks good. Um, so <clears throat> for the first part, I wanted to give a brief outline. So I wanted to. Uh, basically talk about what is automated decision making, um, what makes a decision making system fair or unfair, what type of harms sort of occur in such a system, uh, what the, what, like, where these biases or the harms come from, and how we might be able to detect that. Um, and if we detect that the system is unfair, then how can we prevent them from being unfair? Um, to give a very brief intro, so this is like uh, maybe more you know, easy for you, but the basic idea is we have some data, we train some model, and this model makes decisions. Yeah? And the decisions, let's to, to sort of simplify everything and not make it really complex, are thumbs up and thumbs down. Um, and if we sort of, we, we sort of use those models in many different domains, credit checks, fraud detection, hiring decisions, many, many different domains, and they affect our daily lives. So they should be fair or treat everybody fair, whatever that means. 
Yeah, but I think we can agree that they should be fairly uh, fair or should treat people fairly. What it means is something we're gonna try to figure out today. Um, and I want to also emphasize one thing, a model can be many different things. So many, a model can be a set of decision rules. A model can be business logic, yeah, just like a fixed rule set. Not, set, not doesn't need to be a machine learning model, but it still can be unfair, yeah. Um, but it can also be like logistic regression models, neural networks, whatever. So that's the, <coughs> the basic uh, idea of a model. Uh, yeah. Um, so move on. Yeah. Uh, I got the feedback that the screen is not shared right now. Yeah, that is a good feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I shared it before. Uh, maybe it stopped. Does it work now? It's shared now, yeah. Let's do that. All right, yep. Yeah. Thanks. And let's do it. Thanks for the <laughs> comment. Uh, okay, so why should we care about this? Um, and I just it's an important topic, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I just brought a few headlines from the news. Um, I found interesting was from the paper. Um, so this is sort of a problem in many, many different disciplines. Uh, the first one is the paper, um, which is about gender imbalance, basically that resulting in bias classifiers. So just the, the, the fact that the data sort of might not be balanced, might have less data for women or something like that, um, might lead to bias classifiers and then naturally downstream worse decisions for those people. And if we can prevent that, we should. Um, the second one is uh, in the work context. So in Austria, for example, there was a discriminatory algorithm called out by an employment agency that basically decided whether somebody gets like a I think uh, some sort of intervention sponsored by the state. And this was so super biased against uh, women and against disabled people. Um, and they, they wrote it, they uh, sort of uh, ripped it out again and it's not being used anymore. Uh, but for the first like, year or so, there was a, a large discussion around that. Um, in the hiring contest, there's like this high profile case from Amazon. And then there's one I particularly like, and if you have ever have time to like look into that, uh, look into this one. So this is from the Bayerischer Rundfunk, which is here in Munich, um, a news agency basically. And what they did is basically they put um, actors in front of the green screen and had them take um, hiring interviews with sort of machine learning, uh, video-based like hiring systems. And what they just did is basically they just exchanged the green screen, uh, the background. Um, we, I guess we agree that the background shouldn't really matter for a hiring decision, but they found that that actually does a lot, um, which is a super great like thing to investigate, and I love that. Um, yeah. So, any questions? Um, yeah. So, what kind of harms do actually occur if we employ? Mm -hmm machine learning algorithm systems that um, are biased or like are biased against some parts of the population. Um, so the first one I wanted to talk about is allocation harm, which basically means that sometimes you might not get an opportunity, something you want, a resource. For example, in the case of Austria's of the, the algorithm in Austria, you don't get an intervention sponsored by the state. Yeah. So you're not allocated a good, you should be yeah, get it. Yeah. Then the second one is quality of service, which basically means that the system doesn't work equally well for all groups. For example, um, if the medical diagnosis depends on machine learning algorithm and it just works worse because you have darker skin, that's not really fair, and if we can prevent it, we should try. Um, then I will not touch upon all of them, but maybe important is also stereotyping integration harm, which basically means that um, sometimes a system, and I will provide a few examples, just as reinforces stereotypes that we have seen in society. So um, this has been better by now, but like one example I've seen a lot is if you Google doctor, 
um, and images of doctors, usually you just get images of old folk. Right? And that's sort of like if everybody thinks, or if machine learning systems think doctors are always old white men, um, and then you present them with somebody who's younger and maybe female uh, presenting, and then, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's sort of stereotypes that shape our society and sort of perpetuate the things that are, um, might not be okay in our society. Um, the second uh, one is the integration, which basically means um, sometimes systems can also be offensive or outright. I mean, chatbots are the case where um, they might just be outright offensive. And we try to sort of, and also like people that develop systems, chatbots, try to sort of prevent this. But first of all, we basically need to identify that. And second, uh, to, to basically be able to combat those things. And one thing that's also very important is some of those harms are only experienced by those affected. So if I, as an average developer, for example, am light-skinned and I test the system and it works, that doesn't really mean that it works for everybody. Yeah? And if my whole, like the whole people I'm surrounded by are light-skinned, also might mean that it does, doesn't mean that it works for everybody. So I think that there was this very famous case of the hand drives that didn't work for dark-skinned people. Um, does anyone know that? Yeah, this is like quite com uh, quite famous, basically. So the, you know the hand dries where you basically put in your hands and it dries plus uh, air to you. Um, there used to be some systems out there that didn't work for darker skin people because basically they just tested it on whites. It's not even an algorithm; it's just basically a decision system, automated decision system, I guess. Um, that simply wasn't ever tested on it. Yeah. All right, so where do those harms come from? Um, partially, like if you see them in the system, partially they come just from the historical data we have available. Um, so data basically reflects how things were in the past, not necessarily how we want them to be in the future. Um, and yeah, so one thing for example is poor areas have, high, so this is sort of a reinforce, self-reinforcing thing also, Poorer areas in the city have maybe more police presence. That also means more arrests and offenders. And then basically you see, oh yeah, where's, where, what's the area with the most arrests? That's where we send the police, so we have even more arrests. Um, another one, I screenshotted from Google sometimes in 2018 because I saw it on, uh, I think on Twitter back then, is, so in Turkish, is that, does anybody speak Turkish? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so can can you explain what we see because you can might be able to explain it better. Yeah. So the O is basically he or she. It's yeah. Really not a, a gender. Yeah. And he is like he, and then either a nurse or a doctor. Yeah. And the nurse is translated to she, and the doctor is translated to he, which is again sort of the same stereotype. If you try this now, it doesn't work again um, because they got like famous on Twitter and they fixed it. But that doesn't mean that it, this works in every case. Yeah. Yeah. And you can ask uh, ChatGPT um, with a sentence: uh, "The doctor yelled at the nurse because she was late, yeah. and because he was late." And you find the gender bias in ChatGPT. Yeah. yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Basically. And that basically is just how things were in the past, and we perpetuate that. <laughs> um, then there's representation bias which basically is if the training data or data we use our model on, uh, we evaluate our model on, doesn't really reflect the entire population, uh, we can well, often get models that sort of work poorer for some uh, people. And, and the example here is from uh, gender checks from Timothy Gilbo, uh, which and basically they evaluated face facial recognition systems from different companies, so commercial stuff. Um, on different skin types. So they picked women and just sorted them by sort of skin type um, in seven categories. And you can see that like towards the end, it's basically a coin flip whether they get it right. And if some, let's say, decision now depends on you being recognized correctly, it's absolutely unfair and you're like disadvantaged. Another thing, um, data often doesn't really exist as, again for women. Um, Historically, like years ago in medicine, women were often weren't really included in studies. Um, and there, this is sort of why this whole area of gender medicine sort of popped up in the last 15, 20 years, I think. Yeah. Um, where we, we now sort of 
try to collect more data from women because, for example, some drugs actually work different for women than for men. And if you only ever tested on men, um, you, you don't really know. All right. Um, <coughs> yeah, there's other biases, uh, just sort of very briefly. Um, there's measurement bias, which basically means which you might have not have the sort of the same data quality across all, um, all health hospitals, for example. Uh, you might just have model biases because your model is underspecified or overspecified. And there's feedback loops. Um, so this idea of, for example, more arrests, more police, more arrests. Yeah. Um, any questions? Yeah. Why are we only talking about systems and not about the data generating process in the yeah. first place? <laughs> yeah. So that we, we sort of assume that we can't really change the data generating process in many cases because that's sort of the world we live. The data generating process is kind of the world we live in. I guess sometimes we can actually. Yeah. Um, I guess you can make mistakes there as well. Yeah, absolutely. So and I guess that, that we should talk about. Absolutely, yeah. And that's a, a true problem. That, that's one of the reasons why basically those biases exist because you focus on the populations that are cheap, like on the data that's cheap to acquire and not the ones that, that allows, sort of allows for fair evaluation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to, to start here, um, you can maybe think about this a little bit in the meantime, uh, which kind of biases might we have in this process. So I'll just sort of talk through it a little bit. Let's imagine we have like a loan applicant. Um, he or she goes from, through some credit scoring and um, she's accepted or denied. There's a repayment process. This lands in the historical data, so whether basically um, it's the labels. And now we can uh, train, mm -hmm. train them all again, basically. Any ideas of what biases or what, what harms might occur? Yeah. Discrimination based on age or gender. Absolutely, yeah. Sorry? I didn't understand. Uh, your origin, where are you from? Ethnicity. Yeah, ethnicity, ethnicity, yeah. In terms of the sort of biases, absolutely. In terms of the biases we've sp spoken about before, what can happen? Registration yeah. numbers. Yeah. Very, very, very recent. Okay, yeah, that is also, that's very often sort of tightly coupled with ethnicity, for example, because very often sort of people of a stiff, stiff, like the same nationality, ethnicity, they live closer together, for example. Um, yeah, yeah. Income levels. Absolutely, yeah. This is, yeah. Sometimes you have people who are not making money, but they have a lot of savings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that can happen, yeah. What, um, and maybe thinking a little bit about the biases. Yeah. So someone similar to me is looking at the historical data, so similar age and ethnic yeah. background, and uh, probably represented as they are not paying back their loan. But I will lose my chance uh, if I'm also going to pay it normally. Uh, if I'm a right decision, but I could just be classified in the other group just because of my features. Yeah. That are underrepresented in yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Yeah. What about the sex? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also be sort of a reason for bias, not a, not a bias per se, but a reason for why bias is sort of occurring in the moment. Yeah. Um, I'll give you sort of my version. I found sort of a, a lot of biases. So um, as you said, there might be sort of a model bias. Um, the model might not pick up on some important differences, maybe because it's underspecified, for example, because it's so simple, simplistic. Um, and that goes then into the credit scoring and might sort of result in, for example, women not getting 
so if, um, the same treatment. <clears throat> then the second one is the feedback loops. Um, and that's, as I think, actually quite an important one. Um, if you're denied, we will never find out whether you would have paid back the loan. So our code complete historical data is very heavily biased in that sense. Um, and that's something we should think about when we, for example, build a credit scoring system. Like, what about the people that got denied and we have never seen them before, basically? Uh, we, we don't even get their list there. Yeah. Uh, we don't even get their data. So we have yeah, no historic data on them. Yeah? Um, I have a question. Why do you do a long application process? Yeah. I mean, yeah. as input information will go to the it's not relevant to the process, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so there's two things. Two things. Um, that's a very good comment. Um, so in the US, for example, um, you can't even you are not even allowed to collect it as a bank, which makes it hard for you because also mm -hmm. now I can test whether my system is biased against gender because I don't know it. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it might, for example, be that, so if you think about careers, for example, women and men have still like often very sort of different career paths in the sense that women often take a break to sort of uh, take care of children, for example, um, more often than men. And that means basically that maybe you should take that into account when you think, you think about credit decisions. Because if somebody, for example, took three years to take care of the children, uh, and didn't work, that's not the same as somebody sitting at home and being unemployed or something like that, yeah. And that's something that is often sort of, when you just look at income or like the income of the over the last years, that's often not reflected. So often you should actually sort of maybe correct for that if you want to do that. That's, yeah, a little bit open for discussion in the sense that what fairness means is something we haven't really discussed yet, but something you should think about. Yeah. Like in those cases, what? What would you say kind of happens or what was your assessment then? I don't know, I'm kind of inherently having a bias in my data because it used to be that case like in yeah. the previous year, right? Yeah. So is that then something that the system automatically should adjust for? And then maybe lose the bank some money to do this for more fair in that regard? Is that like, like a legal thing to prepare for? And, and even if there are any constraints, like um, what can the bank really do to um, see if that system is working then? Yeah, Personally. yeah, that's um, it's a very good question. Um, so <coughs> parts of it I'll touch upon a little later when we talk about like fairness and meaning. Um, the other thing, so this is a really in interesting case because what people have started doing, for example, in the US to be able to assess this is they've started to estimate the gender or estimate nationality. <coughs> so, for example, they took the name and from the name they tried to estimate guess the nationality and then be fair with respect to that, which is kind of stupid. Um, because you have you make new errors and now you kind of assume things about people that might not be true. Um, but at the same time, like your model, if there's any like strong correlation, your model like between name, if you use something like the name as a feature, it also comes in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, so the, the third one is representation bias, which is basically, um, for example, historically women didn't take a lot, of, a lot of loans because historically very often sort of the men in the household took out the loans and the women did. So that's way less historical data about women taking out loans. And I think that's still the case. Um, so there might be sort of more uncertainty, less data about, for example. Um, yeah. And then there's the whole historical bias where, for example, yeah. Yeah. Is this actually encouraging biases to the moment? Like, uh, yeah, if you don't control it, it kind of does. And still, can, can they still use this kind of? Mm, I mean, so this is sort of the naive <laughs> group, I guess. And if you think about it, there's regulators, there's people that look into that critically. And it's it's not that nobody tries to do anything against it. And this is sort of. We, for example, I think for credit decisions, we don't use data from 20 years ago. It's kind of a uh, hyperbole um, or like, yeah. So 
the world is changing and we're adjusting to that and we're using more and more recent data, for example, to train the model. So it's not as so that, that it, gets, it gets worse and worse, yeah, <clears throat> I would say. But I think there's still problems and we're kind of just not really evaluating them. Um, but we will also get to that when we talk about legal stuff because um, very often sort of the changing something might require sort of being able to make a legal argument for that and that's a completely different beast. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then like other things like historical bias, which basically um, some sort of subgroups in our in our um, in our communities have had harder times uh, paying back loans in the past because of uh, I know worse chances of employment, but <coughs> the, our society changes and that we change um, and this changes with that. All right. Um, yeah, so the next part I wanted to talk about is diagnosing bias. Um, so the idea is now that we assume we have some problems or we try to build a model, like how do we figure out whether we have biases? Um, and there's two perspectives on that um, to basically say, how, is, is something fair or not? Um, there's actually a, a few more and I'm like leaving out a lot, but that's just what I can talk about today, I guess. And the one I think that's quite interesting is basically called individual fairness, which basically means that similar people should be treated similarly. And that's kind of, I mean, I guess everybody can roughly agree to that. Yeah. Yeah. What are similar people? That's the very good question. That's the next question. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, the other perspective, so I, I don't have an answer. <laughs> um, the other question perspective is basically um, group sort of motivates the, the concept of group fairness on pair average, basically average of an entire group. <coughs> groups of people should be treated equally. So um, if really if you compare men, men to women, on average they should be treated equally. That's something we can measure more easily because we have sort of groups in our data and we can compare them against each other. But yeah, exactly what is similar to people and what is even similar treatment. Um, that's like not really easy to measure. And I think nobody really has made a good argument. Like, is it the Euclidean distance on, like, on some features? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, but like people, like in the beginning, when people started doing fairness from machine learning, people did that. Um, and the other question in this group context is basically, are the groups actually comparable? Can, can I make this argument that they should be treated equally? Yeah. Sometimes they might not be. Um, yeah, so just some very nice um, introductions to like basically talk about or like introducing some notation. And, um, in fairness, we talk usually about legally protected groups. That means things like age, uh, sex, disability, ethnic origin, things like that. So basically, that are somewhere in law written down as legally protected. Um, we usually don't care about as much in, in the fairness context about groups that are not sort of relevant from a legal perspective. Um, and we usually, so we denote this with, uh, with A, basically, the sensitive attribute. Um, and to simplify everything, we just assume that everything is binary. Um, so you are in group one or in group zero. Yeah. And then there's a, there's a decision D, um, which is basically accept or deny. So again, binary to simplify. Um, yeah. And usually sort of this decision should conform with the true outcome Y. I guess I don't think anything new. Um, yeah, just to make it sort of give a very brief example. So somebody with some features X and uh, A plus one, which might mean, for example, female, receives a decision uh, denied, but would have actually paid back the loan. Yeah, and this is an error. Basically, like, there's nothing really interesting in that. Um, so now we can think about what definitions in this group context basically would mean. Um, so we, we sort of zooming in on this group perspective because the individual perspective is kind of 
iffy a little bit. It kind of makes sense, but at the same time, we need to make so many, like define so many things, and we would maybe um, argue about um, this for the, the rest of the next one hour or something. Um, and there's two. So here's basically um, two, two general sort of directions in this group context. Uh, one is the idea of equality of opportunity, which basically means that the chance to deservedly, in quotations, obtain a favorable outcome is independent of the sensitive attribute. So basically, um, if I would have paid back the loan and I get accepted, this, this chance um, in my data is equal across groups. And then sort of, I tried to like show that with that picture. If you're sort of, it, it's not a very good depiction of that, but uh, if you sort of uh, are not old enough to look over the fence, you get to look over the fence. Um, whereas in the other direction, we have statistical parity, which basically just means that the decision should be independent of the sense of that. Yeah. And with decisions is basically, do I get to look over the fence? And basically, I have to lift up everything, everybody to the same level as a definition of things. Any disagreements? Yeah, but it's not a quality now because the left guy doesn't have any box, right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Does that, yeah. <clears throat> but they, maybe, like in some situations, we might want this outcome so that everybody gets the same. And in the other, it's basically a different. It's more like a joke. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, but like it's. It's a real question because in other contexts it does like this this form of sort of fairness doesn't really make sense. You can't accept everybody um, to <clears throat> some degree program that had uh, only about 50 spots. Yeah. So sometimes you sort of need to uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's completely unfair. They didn't even pay to watch the match. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's also the next one. Yeah. I should uh, show another version of that. So, the performance would be uh, to be trusted. If they pay, <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. That's yeah, the one that depends. Yeah. I mean, it's a serious question. I mean, whether you really want to have this, um, I mean, I guess we could call it uniformity of outcomes on the right hand side, right? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you might want to have that. Sometimes these protected attributes might actually be, I mean, in a in a causal and meaningful and maybe acceptable way be correlated with the outcome. And then you don't want to do this. Yeah. And I guess we alone cannot also decide this, right? This is a very difficult social question. Yeah? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So the thing I wanted to get at is basically so it requires sort of an ethical judgment. And we are not maybe equipped to make that. But we should sort of at least know what we talk about if we ask somebody to make that judgment. Yeah. Yeah. And just a comment on the right picture. You can also satisfy that by saying, hey, no one gets to look over the fence. That's a very good point. Why is there a fence? <laughs> yeah, that's a <laughs> even better question. Why yeah. not some pay and others can't? All right, um, so to sort of bring this pictures a little bit back. Um, so the first group of, uh, of, of metrics is basically called bias for serving that fairness metrics. Because if there's any sort of bias in the ground truth or in the data we have, we will preserve that. Yeah. If women uh, were not able to pay back their loans due to societal reasons, for example, um, we will still sort of like uh, recover this bias in the malls. Yeah. Um, and yeah, examples for this metric or metrics based on this thinking is equality of opportunity or equality of accuracy. It's very simple. So from the from this gender shades, um, they just look at accuracies, for example. Um, the second group is called bias transforming metrics. So here we basically want the model to transform the world or the decisions. Yeah. If we sort of say it has to satisfy this criteria. Um, yeah, an example is statistical parity. Um, there's a third, third notion, um, and that's called statistic conditional statistical parity, 
And that demands sort of a mixture between the two. Um, so for example, positive rates should be equal given some condition. Um, acceptance at a fire department, for example, should be equal between men and women, given everybody um, like satisfies some minimum height requirement because you just need from a sort of a business perspective to be able to like carry people out of a burning building, you need to have like a minimum strength or something like that. Yeah. And that might be sort of a little bit better. Um, but yeah, it's still not there. Um, yeah. All right. Um, if we now talk about um, how we how to calculate this, we can we could basically just measure uh, the metric of interest, for example, positive rates, positive rates, something like that, in each population, um, and just take the absolute difference or something like that. There's like a lot more ideas on how this could be measured, but that's sort of the simple approach. And now we would be going, we have a metric to measure this. We kind of just need to decide on a metric, um, uh, but then we sort of are ready to go. And optimize using Autumnal or not. Um, yeah, there's an, a very important um, comment here. Um, fairness needs to be evaluated in a representative data set. I will also touch upon that a little bit more later. Uh, yeah. Uh, so with that, I want to give a very first sort of warning. Um, fairness metrics, especially, reduce many, many considerations. I mean, we've sort of seen this as like ethically questionable. Like I think there's a lot of discussions, and we would never be able to agree, I guess, on a, like a single metric usually. Um, and we condense all of this considerations into a single number that we optimize. And that doesn't really reflect, I guess, the complexities of the problem. So we sort of drop, leave out a lot of relevant stuff. Um, and also they can't really um, guarantee that the system is free. All right. Um, now let's assume we have detected some biases. Um, how do we deal with that? Um, and the first naive idea is remove the protected attribute. So let's um, go again with the credit scoring. Let's assume we have a model that has race, uh, zip code, income, and we use that to predict credit. Um, and this is what directly discriminates based on race, because if, if sort of the data and, and the model sort of work in that way. The problem is basically if we now say, well, we can't use race, the model will just learn this correlation between race and the zip code. Because race is often, for example, especially in the US, highly correlated with the zip code. Yeah. And then you just discriminate indirectly by relying on the zip code instead. Mm -hmm. So just say dropping the, the relevant protected attribute is not really the solution. Yeah. Agreements, disagreements. Fairness of privacy. Yeah. It looks like a supervised learning problem. So, in unsupervised, like machine translation, yeah. you want to fix the doctor example, for example. The, for example, when Paris is uh, word embedding, yeah. like to imagine it's uh, close to friends, it's normal. Yeah. But when the word doctor is more close to men, that's a problem. You can maybe figure out which way it reflects to that. Yeah, and fix this way, and then. Yeah. Uh, but when it's a problem, is usually not met. This specific feature causes. Yeah, exactly. So I'm sort of talking about sort of the tabular supervised yeah. classification setting mostly. But if you go into generative AI, for example, this is a whole other beast of a problem. This is like way more difficult because we don't really know what to evaluate for. I think we can like make tests, or we can make like large. Testing data sets, prompts, something like that, that sort of test for something, mm -hmm. but it's a whole other problem. Um, I think this is not really solved at all. Um, and there's also tons of research going in that direction. Yep. But I think that the argument <laughs> that still stands is in the simply bi simple binary problem is interesting enough, uh, difficult enough to solve. Um, yeah. Already. Um, then there's a bunch of algorithmic solutions. 
I'd call them. Um, well, I, I mostly uh, I call them technical fixes, which basically means we can pre-process the data. We can use models that have sort of a fairness constraint inbuilt that basically you need um, like we put some like loss on the on the unfairness of the model or something like that, some additional loss. Or we post-process the predictions basically by adapting probabilities, by adopting decisions post hoc. Yeah, we can easily do that. Uh, this is, for example, implemented in Fairlearn um, by, um, I think, mostly by Hilde now developed. Yeah. Um, they kind of work, but at the same time, they don't really because um, they often sort of don't really solve the problem or you trade in a lot of accuracy. Um, and at the same time, it's sort of very well, it suffers a little bit from sort of this solutionism perspective because we, we, we optimize for some metric, but we don't really understand what this does in the real world. Like if we now take this decision, this fair decision in the real world, we don't really understand that. Yeah. Doesn't trading accuracy also imply that the data that was collected is actually the problem and not the training process yeah. itself? That's um, very often the case. Um, but then what do we do if the, the world is biased? You can try to in increase the bias under uh, representative groups, for example. Yeah, so collect more data. For example, what do you mean? Yeah. So if one certain race is under the representative mm -hmm. data set, then they, they need to increase. Yeah. yeah. I think what you said is not necessarily true, right? It doesn't. Yeah. It might also mean that we do not want to predict on certain things because we don't necessarily agree with how things currently are. It yeah. doesn't mean that the data, I mean, the data can be flawed, but it doesn't have to be, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we want to, but maybe we want to, don't want to exploit certain things in terms of making accurate predictions because we disagree with the correlation that's currently there. And yeah. We don't want to perpetuate that. So that's a different problem. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can try to treat a missing observation with some sort of data. I'm not sure if this works yeah. in this setting. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea. Uh, investigate. Mm -hmm. Go go home and investigate <laughs> after this. Yeah. I mean, why not? Um, yeah. And like, again, if we just optimize and look at some metric, we might arrive here um, because if we level down, if nobody gets to see the game, it's also kind of fair by depending on the metric. Yeah. And also I like this perspective of, I mean, the thing we see, we measure, is kind of a symptom, it's not the root cause. I and mean, if we only ever fix the symptoms, we don't really, Treat the problem. Yeah. Um, then there's one thing I really like, uh, which is documentation. You don't, but you get to like it. <laughs> um, so one harm, and there's a pretty interesting paper about that is basically that very often models are just not used as they were intended. So paper builds, for example, something for trauma prediction, predicting the trauma of a child, and then this was used for reimbursement of the cost of the child because more traumatic child, more traumatized child get more uh, get more money reimbursement, and then people are optimizing for more trauma because then they get more money, which doesn't mean that the children are worse, but at the same time, like the symptoms and people like the like on a on a sort of diagnostic level. Um, and if we like document and make sure that people understand what the model is intended to, to do, we can prevent, like we can't prevent stupid people, but we can at least sort of say, well, this is not, like here it says you should not use it for that. Um, there's two main papers on that. Uh, one is about documenting data sets and their intended use, the other about models. Um, I think it's really worth it. Like, <clears throat> Also, if you consider, like, think about automatic like building systems that automatically output such documentation. Yeah. Or common sense should also tell us that we should really do this. Yeah. And I think people who have been saying this for 20 to 50 years yeah. 
Uh, I think we should listen to those as well. Yeah. I, I think I'm not going to say anything. Needed to I'm, not, I'm not against these papers. There are some nice things in there, uh, but, but the data and models and tasks should be properly documented. I think this is sometimes also a function of us being, I don't know, too much computer science engineering guys who just want to like solve production problems, but we don't care too much about the underlying tasks and, and social relevance and so on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Also, there's, I think you can solve a lot, like see a lot of problems by just like helping people to understand the data. Um, I think Annie Müller's um, package, what, what is it called, uh, double, is quite nice and because it provides a lot of plotting functionality. So yeah. AutoML, yeah. double, yeah. Is it an A? D A B L, I think, yeah. Yeah, but the devil, man. Devil, yeah. Yeah. Space yeah. It's, it's an automatic system. Um, and I kind of I use it for the plotting. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, because like you give it a data set, you get like a few good plots, and that helps a lot. Yeah. yeah. We basically at like the last autumn art conference uh, also said this is how most people actually use it and where you got most feedback from. Yeah. Because that's something that well, the other autumn art systems don't provide. Yeah. 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 When Andy explained this to me, you also never like sold this as a complete auto ML with emphasis on automatic system, right? But some incremental modeling where the human is involved and then I guess plots and visualizations are pretty great, right? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it has sort of this like tuning a few models. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Devil. D, D A B L. Yeah. By Andy Miller, the cycle uh, some yeah. 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 So you circling back to Ben's uh, comment about like uh, yeah, all see the world in a very computer science world way. Um, I am wondering um if so i have seen a take for for this kind of discussions to go okay so if we identify that there is um a group that is underrepresented or there is like a group bias or correlation that we want to avoid uh then like let's counter it by like uh increasing or decreasing weight accordingly yeah. or this kind of stuff which in a black box system can have all kinds of effects that we're unaware of so i um yeah i am aware of like from a humanistic point of view, yeah. very often it's about increasing the awareness in the population about yeah. certain topics, about this bias. So do you think we can also, uh, are, yeah, I'm wondering if this is like two schools and then uh, that are like discussing with each other, what is, uh, with each other, what is the best solution about that? But um, yeah, one being the one take of, okay, no, let's like then adapt our model to, yeah. do, to not do that and to create the world we hope to have. Or the other being okay. So instead of like fixing it and maybe introducing bias we're unaware of, uh, just creating I don't know some kind of warning system or something that raises awareness uh, in some manner. Of course, yeah. I guess like that can also be exploited, but that's another just point or question. I think that's a very good point. So I think the first part is raising awareness is absolutely I think the most important thing to do. I think also like evaluating the model with respect to biases, even if you don't do it perfectly, is way, way better than not doing it. I forgot the second part of the answer I wanted to give, um, but it'll pop up again. <laughs> and I guess in general, being able to explain the model and having it more grayish than black, I mean, that helps, right? So, I mean, this how do we then like make the model more fair? That's, I, mean, I guess, what's your whole talk about, but this is pretty complicated. Yeah. but. At least being able to understand the current state already helps maybe getting a little bit closer to the answer. So the more black box it is, I guess the more difficult this will be, right? Yeah. So you can either evaluate this from the outside and subgroups and so on, but we can also maybe try to understand the, the, the model structure a bit yes. better, right? That would also help, I guess. Yeah, I agree. And the second, yeah. So now the second part of the answer came back. Great. Um, so even if you set it by the same fairness criteria, you make your model fair, it doesn't really mean that you create the intended effects in society. Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. if you now just randomly accept a lot of like uh, candidates for an interview, for example, even if they're not qualified, yeah, this just will this will not help. I guess where we will reinforce it, and then they say like. Well, we tried it, it didn't work, now we don't need to try it. Yeah. So you need to do like this targeted, not random, um, and with like well thought out. 
and what value or what usage do you see them? Uh, yeah, in that case, because for example, okay, so uh, if we adapt our model to then take candidates that would not be suitable because of uh, yeah, a societal problem that we as computer scientists or uh, evaluating applications have no control over at that point. Um, yeah, I think very often like the computer scientists are also not the commonly um, involved in the, the HR and the hiring yeah. process of everyone yeah. in a company. So um, yeah, what do you think then is? It's, yeah, no, no idea. I think it's not really, yeah. I'm not really solved. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting into actually a lot yeah. more and more people outside of the group. Yeah, yeah. This is okay. Yeah. Sorry, we're going to be here. Thank you. Um, yeah. So you talked about also, you were talking about the legal attributes. Like yeah. Related things. Yeah. So this includes like gender. And, yeah. Okay. So you were saying you were updating those, um, the, all the data. You're not doing the data from 20 years. Yeah. So what about like, you can think about if you could think about time shift from in the data, not only in knowledge but also in location. Yeah. Imagine the imagine the case that Deutsche Bank, Deutsche Bank yeah. is working in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um, and I think yeah, I think you're gonna have like really different attributes uh, or like options for each attribute. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, so basically, like, you can't directly apply the same model. Like, not only in time, but also in mm -hmm. dimensions. Yeah. It's also very good sort of um, work on basically also like what ethics is. So we, we are sort of looking at ethics and what's fair from a like very Eurocentric perspective. But in other communities, in other um, parts of the world, fairness would be defined very differently. And also, so we can't really, like, this is just like, a very Eurocentric or um, perspective on everything. And if you go to other parts of the world, you might need to design and come up with completely new ideas. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it depends. <laughs> Sometimes it, it can help. Um, there's like in this pre processing literature, there's basically ideas in that direction. Um, but very often, you kind of need to think about what the decisions in the real world actually mean. And this is like, if you just generate some like random data, and now your model does like slightly different decisions. My, yeah, it's, it's hard to like now like propagate this too to the this, like effect in the real world. Um, and I think we are not really good at measuring the effect in the real world with those fairness measures. And then, like, so, so the problem is sort of wrongly poised in that sense. There are also going to be biases, right? That we yeah, yeah. And that's the same, like, if we talk about language generation, there's biases um, if we talk about the data. Um, I continue very briefly and then uh, we'll be through with the first part. Um, so the first thing is, um, what can else can we do? And the first aspect, and I want to emphasize this, is we can also think about the problem we are actually trying to solve. Yeah. So we can say we want to detect welfare fraud. And that's a problem, like that's a fraud detection setting, and we punish people. But instead, we can also say, well, we want to identify people that are underserved by welfare and that should get welfare, should get um, insurance, and they don't. And now you solve a different problem. And now fairness is also very different because it's unfair if you. If you don't get like if you if you now get ignored and it's the now the model makes an error, but it's way worse because you you're not getting something you weren't getting anyway, um, and some people get lifted up sort of, and so just like the question you're trying to answer is makes a lot of like difference in that sense. Then um, I mean there's an entire book about this accountability and recourse thing. Uh, I forgot the name, um, but um, basically the idea is that sometimes when the models make errors, the companies that use those models don't really have any sort of ways for me to say your model made an error, fix it. Yeah, and I need to like call some hotlines for hundreds of hours to to get a wrong solution fixed. 
<clears throat> and that's something sort of that's not part of the machine learning system, but part of the system this machine learning model operates in, where we basically need to ensure that people can uh, fix wrong decisions, unjust decisions, by sort of uh, talking to somebody, getting it fixed, and not just saying, well, the model decided that I can't do anything about it, even if it's not correct yet. But very often, sort of the systems make those decisions, and the people, maybe the hotlines, can't really even do something about it. So every time you sort of think about such a model, you need to think about how, like, what happens if, if it makes an error? How can people get that fixed? And that, for example, also means access to an explanation. Um, there was this in the EU, EU uh, law, I think there's this right to an explanation. What that exactly means doesn't really, is, I think is not really transparent, um, but yeah, the kind of factors in there as well. And yeah, we've talked about the presentation, that's just the whole. Um, to sort of summarize the first few points, um, if you really want to sort of ensure fair decisions, uh, you need basically um, support in your entire organization. Um, not just the engineering teams, but also the engineering teams, but also basically everybody who sort of maintains this, uses this, um, or, yeah, or just needs to respond to outputs. The second is basically this diverse perspectives, um, kind of need people maybe also from the group that are most hurt by such a system um, to be sort of included in any discussion on the system. Um, and yeah, we will touch about this more um, in the next slides. Fairness metrics can help you to identify bias, but having fair metrics doesn't mean you yeah. And also one thing, um, I find really difficult about metrics is, so we have this like societal context, this is massive, it's complex, people uh, act in it. And now we condense everything to one number. And this number doesn't really mean anything because this number might mean like it's 0 0.3, but we have no idea what that actually means. Like zero. How many people that live or die is that? Yeah. It's a, I mean, it's kind, it's kind of weird actually. Um, so I think it also really makes sense to think about the, what these decisions and numbers actually mean in terms of like real world quality, like of quantity, quantities in real world, like yeah, how many people die. And that's something we are very good at in machine learning, basically abstracting away uh, difficult things and ignoring all the other things. Um, yeah. So now we come to the second part. Um, yeah, so maybe just sort of now sort of going into the intersection of autonomy and fairness. Um, so if we think about a data science project, we currently sort of, we have the steps of like understanding the problem, um, understanding the data, maybe pre-processing it a little bit. Then we basically give it to an automated system that's sort of in this massive box. Then we do some evaluation, post hoc, and then we deploy the model. That's sort of the normal scope. And I think by now you kind of agree that just adding fairness metric might only be part of the solution. Yeah. Do you? <laughs> Did that come across? I don't know. <laughs> um, but if you look into like literature, basically, and I'm also guilty myself uh, of that myself, uh, this is what people did for quite a while and still some of them do. Um, and it's also not entirely wrong, it's just you could do better. Um, and people took basically yeah. usually two perspectives on that. Um, but yeah. uh, the first one is basically fairness as a second objective. So you basically kind of trade off fairness, for example, against accuracy, and then you basically pick a model on this greater front. Um, that sort of is fair enough, but at the same time um, satisfies my accuracy business requirement. Yeah. So it's basically multi objective optimization with two or three for every. Um, the second one is basically fairness as a constraint. So you basically satisfy a minimum constraint on unfairness, and then you basically optimize accuracy or error or something like that within that constraint. And then we maybe arrive at a point like that. So, 
Yeah. This is again considering firms as a number. Yeah. Yeah. And, but like, yeah, so I, I don't want to say this is what you should do, but this is how it's been done. Mm -hmm. um, and also how I have been doing it. So I'm, I, I think it's fair that I say this, this is maybe not the best idea, but it's an idea. Yeah. Um, I just like, yeah, I cited a few papers that kind of did it there. Um, that's just kind of the approach people have taken. Um, and it's not the stupidest idea. Like it does something, um, if we evaluate it properly, it might, we might arrive at a, like a more fair and more accurate model. Yeah, that, that might just be the case. Um, this just like doesn't like alleviate us from having to really properly evaluate this afterwards. Yeah. I guess one I can criticize that, but you also then have to come up with a constructive alternative, I guess, at the end, right? So yeah. the problem that we have is that we have this multitude of models and configurations. And for a single model, we, I would make the same argument. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I would make the same argument just for general evaluation. <coughs> don't boil it down to a single single metrics and numbers, visualize it, look at it, think about it. But at the end, if you go through a whole zoo of different models and configurations, it helps a lot if it's a, just a few numbers, because then you can somehow sort and optimize, right? Yeah. If these metrics are garbage, then yeah, it becomes garbage and garbage out. I think what we might be sort of able to get away with is, is first of all, we can hope that those metrics are kind of correlated at least with what we want. They don't measure what we want, but we might hope that they are correlated. Um, and the second part is, like if I come up with a better metric or a set of better metrics than the, the stupid ones I just talked about, like once that sort of encompass more of the thing we want, we can still like optimize it. Yeah. So this is not per se stupid, it's just we shouldn't oversimplify and we should be careful when you do that. And the problem I see, I see with, yeah, I, I'll talk about this more afterwards. Um, first, the problem with metrics. Uh, <laughs> I think I've made it clear. Um, yeah, you can read the quotes for your slide, oh, just read them. Um, yeah, so the first one is sometimes recognizing the limits of the possible is the problem of wisdom. Not all problems are solvable, and either, even fewer problems are solvable than metrics. So sometimes we just have to accept that we can't really measure that. Yeah. And for, especially in the societal context, we might not be able to measure that, but what we might do is we might try to get like as close as we can to something and then see what this means in the real world. If you have to deploy an automated model because it's there's a bit other way, or even like humans aren't even fair all, all of the time, so that's the same problem in, in a different way. Um, so we might just be able to get better, and if we can now then afterwards like evaluate properly <coughs> many different <coughs> perspectives. It might be a better model than the one without any optimization. Uh, any optimization. Yeah. So metrics are proxies for what we care about, but they don't. Yeah, you can hope they're correlated. Um, and the other one is not really tied to metrics, but I just found it interesting. Um, after identifying cross-selling as a measure of long-term customer relationships, Wells Fargo went overboard, emphasizing the cross-selling metrics. And put like a lot of pressure on the employees to um, sell, like to cross selling. Um, yeah, combined with an unethical sales culture. This led to 3.5 million fraudulent deposit and credit card accounts being opened without a customer's consent. Yeah. So, if you just push people to uh, optimize for metrics, uh, this might have like super bad downstreams. Um, and now just to hammer home a few of my concerns with the metrics and fairness metrics especially. Um, they don't really capture the complexities, so they rely on observational data alone and sort of all the causal relationships that happen in our world are kind of ignored. There's cause, there's a whole bunch of research in sort of causal fairness metrics. I, um, they kind of solve it, but at the same time not because they rely on like super simplistic models of how the world works. So, and then you also have to like figure out, like decide on what the causal graph basically in, in, in our society is, which is also not material. Yes. Um, then they lie, rely on the assumption that our labels are known, correct, fair. 
Um, if we want to decide on simply uh, multiple metrics, they might not be compatible in the sense that sometimes you can't just constant satisfy both. Um, and then if I, for example, want to take the constraint perspective, we need to define sort of a threshold of what is fair enough. And that's also kind of strange. Um, yeah, as I already said also, they kind of hide away or simplify this real world impact of the decision because we just boil it down to a number. We don't really know what it means. And if there's individual circumstances to the decision, which a human might take into account, um, you came too late because yeah, there's a reason you couldn't really sort of, uh, yeah, I went and sort of uh, couple before, a, a human might sort of take another decision than a machine that just, yeah. Um, the next part is, and that's something that's completely under researched, I think, so I'm, I'm sort of doing a little bit like pointing you to some future research stuff, um, is basically metrics measure the, if they, not even the short term, but the past actually, because we use it on observational data, so they, they measure the effect of this decision in the past, which doesn't do anything for like the short term and even worse for the long term. Kind of completely ignore this, so downstream effects. Um, yeah. um, and they are sort of very, sometimes very single perspective in the sense that we might have like a diverse set of wants um, or of, of, of things people want from our model. Um, and if we can't like narrow point everything down to a model, uh, to, to a metric, we can optimize for this gets kind of disregarded sometimes. Also sort of qualitative accounts. So the idea that sometimes just like uh, talking to somebody can also give you an uh, interesting sort of bit of information is kind of disregarded. Um, and now I want to connect it to the legal um, field. So in, uh, in the law, we basically also have, um, again, disclaimer that's a field I know nothing about. Um, we have this idea of fairness and we have laws that basically prohibit you from being unfair. But if we now translate this back to data, this is become very interesting. So first of all, uh, legal principles usually require a regulated setting. So they don't apply to everything, but just to like certain settings. For example, job. And then within job, there's a host of fairness principles. But fairness principles just don't translate across, um, across different laws. The second, in which a protected group, so this is what we see, but also that means sufficient representative data of this group. If we just assume simple IID data or just like randomly collected one, we can't really assume that. Um, it's compared to an appropriate comparator population. So for example, I can't, like if I want to make a case for like a job, um, so not getting a job or something in Berlin because I'm a woman or, or a man, I can't compare to uh, like men in, I don't know, men in, in Munich and women in Berlin or something like that. Yeah, it doesn't mm -hmm. make sense because sort of you need to have sort of the appropriate comparator population. And even what the appropriate comparator population is, people often don't agree with. Is it like people in Berlin, people in Germany, people in Europe? Completely okay. Um, using an appropriate test statistic, so it needs to be sort of significant, statistically significant, not just random. Um, then we need to control for fair and unfair mechanisms in the sense that sometimes it's okay uh, to be biased because, for example, if just from a business perspective, a business necessity, income, for example, for a trade decision is something that's very likely should um, have an influence on income and um, yeah, what, what you have in your bank account or something like that should be, it, it's kind of a requirement. And I, so sometimes I have sort of uh, mechanisms that are fair actually, but just hide for a fire man, man, man. might also be a requirement. You need some basic fitness or, or fitness. fitness like um, and you need to avoid other sources of direct or indirect direct discrimination at the same time. And also the law usually argues that you need to demonstrate a causal link between the policy, so the decision you make, and the discriminatory outcome. 
So there's quite a disconnect. I found this paper, I, I kind of really like this paper by Ann Watkins. Uh, it's called the four fifth rule on is not disparate impact. And this does this deconstruction basically from one uh, legal text to what we measure. Um, and I've sort of colored the differences. So the first difference is so here it's about certain employment decisions by federal agencies. So this law is only applies to certain decisions by federal agencies. Whereas in Fenton, we just ignore that, that, that part of the case. Um, then like, there's differences where we, for example, this talks about the selection rate, we translate it to the outcome rate. Um, here, the majority group in the, in the fairness metric to place by or uh, is stems from the group with the highest rate. Um, and we kind of omit that this difference needs to be relevant and so this is significant. Uh, so there's a lot of like differences between the legal texts and the fairness metrics because we kind of oversimplify problem. That means if you ever need to be, like define basically uh, or like evaluate fairness of anything, you really need to think about those things, I guess, like what the setting is and what my comparative, like what their populations are basically. So is my population, um, like the population, I, populations I compare, are they comparable? And are they big enough representative? Do they actually cover sort of the distribution I want to cover? Um, then there's a the second part. Yeah. Um, with about the risk of automation, I will skip that, but I think, um, and that is interesting from two perspectives for you as designers of automated systems, but also for the users of automated systems. Um, because um, the first thing I, I sort of saw a lot is basically that users of a system of an automated system have to solve the problem within the constraints of the automated system, if it's not a modular. Um, and if my solution is not within the sort of the constraints, then I will either not be able to use the automated system or I will use the closest within the constraints. Yeah. And that can also have like adverse effects because now it means I might measure something that's not really the thing I, I uh, observe in the real world. Um, the second part is the automated system doesn't see what I can't numerically measure, um, which is this whole thing of qualitative accounts. Um, then again, there's this like the thing with the hammer and the nails and the screws, um, where if you have a nice hammer, you want to use it or something like that. Um, so it's very easy if I have a fancy automated system, it's very easy to overlook solutions that are not machine learning solutions and also like spend less time thinking about what the problem actually is. And also with that comes sort of a tendency to go with a fast and cheap solution instead of yeah, really understanding the problems. And I think we as the tool makers, as the people that build those tools have some obligation to, to steer, to guide the users towards something that sort of um, avoids those problems. It's not trivial, but um, we should at least try to think about it. Another problem with automation is basically, and there's like tons of studies of that, is people overly trust the decisions made by automated systems, um, even if they're obviously stupid, people still might do it. Um, and, we, and I think this is basically this setting where you just have to take a play. Um, and it kind of de deactivates parts of your brain in the sense that you don't really have to like think critically about this uh, anymore. And the second thing is also, you can always go back, like if I have to make the decision as a human, I need to say why I made the decision. If I can just say what the system said, so I'm sort of outsourcing this decision to something else. I'm not culpable. I'm not the one that made an error. Yeah. And that's a problem if you use machine learning systems. Um, yeah, so we push the responsibility to the machine. So let's see what I want to say. Um, yeah. If we think about biases, so from a user perspective, the data we feed the systems, the metrics we decide in, and how we use the system, for example, especially if it's sort of without, outside of the constraints of the system. Um, but we as the developers also can basically, how we design the search space, how we 
formulate the optimization problems um, is irrelevant. Um, and also one thing, but I will also touch upon that later, um, is this the benchmark driven development because we develop a lot on data sets and tasks, like in this fairness context that are completely, that they're not realistic for what we encounter in the real world. Um, yeah, that, with that we come to that. I will not uh, go over benchmarking again, you all know what benchmarking is. Yeah, yeah, Eddie knows it. So if uh, you don't know, ask. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the first thing I want to touch on is uh, data. So yeah, first assumption we often have is data is IID and we can just cross validate. Very often that's not the case. Um, and um, especially decisions that we make now influence the data distribution in the future. Yeah. Then the second one is data fixed. So in fairness, we often talk about, yeah, we can just get more data. In automated systems, we kind of think it's like a fixed thing, or in a benchmark task definition, it's kind of fixed. We can't really throw away anything, we, or we haven't really thought about throwing away data or not using some data, but we also haven't, like think the, the outcome of the automated system is really collect more data. Yeah? And if that should be the outcome, we should maybe tell the users, like, hey, your groups are maybe too small to make a good decision, like, just you don't need to like tell them like I don't do anything because the group such as well, but you might just want to warn them um, if you talk about friends. Um, then we also know, uh, assume that the attributes to protect ones are known and unbiased, which is not the case uh, necessarily. Um, we assume valid labels and data, which is also not the case. We have sometimes noisy data. Um, data is often sort of noisy in a biased way. So for example, the protected uh, groups Sometimes it's noisier, sometimes the labels are less noisy. And yeah, data is always retrospective and observational. So it's data from the past and there's no causal sort of connections, causal links in the data. Um, in the model, um, if we measure fairness, this also disregards a little bit how the model is used, um, which basically means we assume that the model outputs are used as, as it is. And sometimes, um, we have sort of additional business rules around the model um, or additional in, in, uh, interaction with the user of the model and we actually need to take this into account when, you, when we evaluate. Yeah. Um, also for the people build tools that might mean we need to like maybe account for things like that, like have the evaluation protocol a little more open so people can integrate business rules around that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the fairness benchmarks, this is sort of my main complaint. Um, they are kind of unrealistic. We do it on data that's unrealistic. Uh, we disregard a lot of the complexities that are not in, within the modeling step. Um, we don't really think about what, how to design the test sets. Yeah. We should do this, and this would kind of be possible within AutoML. We can sort of craft better test sets. We just need to do it, and we need to ensure that the model does it. Um, yeah, and the data sets that are out there are not really representative for real-world problems. That's a problem we can't only partially solve. 